Welcome, I'm Julian Rogers in the Turks and Caicos. We had a chat with the Premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands, none other than the Honorable Washington Mizik. He is the current Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank, who are due to hold their Governors meeting here in the Turks and Caicos in June. We'll talk to the Premier not only about his role as the leader of the country, but also as that of the President of the Board of Governors of the Caribbean Development Bank and also the President of the UK Overseas Territory Association. He chairs the rotational position as the political council. He's also the Vice President of the Turks and Caicos branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and a representative of the Turks and Caicos Caribbean Heads of Government Meetings, of course, for CARICOM. He's also have that role of building the relationship with regional institutions as well. So, we welcome you, sir. Thank you, the pleasure is mine. Welcome you, Turks and Caicos. I'm looking forward to a fantastic time here with the rest of the Caribbean and for the CDB board meeting. Let's talk first, Premier, about the Turks and Caicos. How have you done? Turks and Caicos has done extremely well. I mean, in terms of where we are, and the recognition of the progress that's been made here. Uh, it's all been fairly new. Every, just about everything you see around here is less than 50 years old. So we're basically, can be considered a new kid on the block, if you like. But uh, we've had a, we have a very successful economy. Um, tourism obviously is our uh, main industry. In fact, it is sometimes said that Turks and Caicos is probably the most tourism dependent country in the world next to Macau. And, um, but we've done very well. We've, we have been able to uh, consistently for the better part of the last six years produce a surplus in our um, revenue, government uh, revenue, our budgets. Uh, we have a triple B plus credit rating. Government have zero debt um, and a very hefty reserve, including a sovereign wealth fund. So I think we're doing very well, all things considered. You know. As you say that, I have to ask you, how did you survive COVID? A confluence of, of events or circumstances meant that we pulled through COVID very, very good. Uh, we had... Um, we had uh, assistance from the United Kingdom. Uh, we got the vaccine early. Our population responded quickly. So we ramped up to about 80% of vaccination rate by the end of the summer of 20, uh, it would have been 2021, I think it would be. And then of course, the fact that we entered the COVID with significant reserve, we were able to really preserve life and, and livelihood by actually uh, assisting the population through stimulus grants and other, other assistance. So yeah, we, we've, we've done very well uh, through COVID. So having gone through that period, what really are the new priorities here? Well, you know, there's a word that's overused sometimes called sustainability. And our focus is on building resilience and sustainability. Um, and that involves uh, focusing on ensuring that they, not only sustainability in terms of the economy, uh, but also in terms of our sensitive environment, which is very much tied to the economy. Everyone in, these, in this island and this country makes their living off the natural capital of the economy. So we're very concerned about ensuring that that is preserved, but also creating the, keeping a, a good social balance. Turks and Caicos depend very, very largely on foreign labor. And so we've got issues of housing and all of those kinds of things that we've got to focus on to ensure that the environment is not degraded and the five-star destination that we are known for is actually maintained. So yes, those are some challenges, but I think we, we've, we've designed and are designing um, solutions and approaches uh, to ensure that uh, the, our economy and our social and environmental um, sectors are, are, are sustainable. You're fresh from presenting a budget to this country. What would you 
say are the priority items that you're addressing in this? You know, um, a big umbrella issue of my government is human capital development. Okay. Also, another big issue at the moment is price inflation. Um, so, what we, and of course, the, the social quality of life issues. So, what the, my budget includes a lot of deals with how do we protect the vulnerable. So, people are looking for social assistance. We've upped the, the level of assistance. Uh, investing huge amount of money in scholarships, grants, and full scholarships, and investing in education. We just acquired property to put uh, ex uh, TVAT, expanding or putting, standing up in place a well-functioning hospitality school. Uh, so the focus really is on the human capital development, improving the social uh, situation of the uh, public and also investing heavily in infrastructure because I believe that wealth is created by the private sector. Government distributes it but is created by the private sector and the private sector needs to have solid, um, dependable, sustainable infrastructure in order to, to run on and to develop uh, that wealth. Let's talk about the infrastructure. It seems the airport is a major priority here. This destination is well served from probably over a dozen gateways in the United States. Uh, the United States and North America generally is our source market for tourism. Uh, we actually have outgrown our current facility uh, and we have to be improvising in order to process the traffic. Uh, so we're making a huge, huge investment in developing a whole new terminal uh, that's going to probably run us into uh, multiple millions of dollars. We're making some good progress with the consultancy, looking at the structure, ownership structure, the funding structure, uh, and um, hopefully we can all have that done between now and the end of the year. So by next year, we can look at uh, scheduling the actual construction time, which I believe will, will probably uh, begin in 2024. Uh, these big projects have huge life cycle. It takes a long planning cycle. And so it's, we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, we're fortunate in that the airports authority itself have significant reserves. Uh, and so we're, we're, we should be able to do it quite comfortably without actually um, consigning the facility to, to an outside operator. What about the communication around the islands themselves? The communication around Turks and Caicos is in need of improvement. Uh, dependency uh, or the, the ability to communicate between the islands, particularly in a bad hurricane, is a problem. And we are now looking at actually putting a fiber ring around the islands to improve that. That is something that is also uh, topical. And again, I expect that, that we'll, we'll see some movement on that in the current financial year. Let's talk now about the relationships you, may, you have with, 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 with the nearby territories, like the Bahamas, for instance. Well, the Bahamas is considered to be family because their bloodlines, of course, the nearest Bahama Island is 40 miles off from here. Uh, Anagua, Mayaguana, between 40 to 60 miles away. And so um, there's always been freedom of movement between here and the Bahamas. Even when the, uh, even in relationship to the, to the legislation is not strictly adhered to when it comes to the movement of people between here and Bahamas. Everybody in the Turks and Caicos Islands and everybody just about in the Bahamas have families in both places. So that relationship is probably our strongest relationship uh, because of the, uh, the uh, our proximity, but also because of the bloodlines between us. Um, of course, in my capacity as the um, president of the 
Caribbean Development Bank, I represent the overseas territories. Uh, the position, of course, as you know, is rotational. So I, I represent uh, places like uh, the British Virgin Islands, Montserrat, and Gwilder, um, Cayman. and the Cayman Islands, and Turks and Caicos. Um, but our relationship, our strongest relationship, remains with uh, the Bahamas. And the historic relationship with, say, Jamaica? We have a historic relationship with Jamaica because we were sort of a sub dependence of the UK through Jamaica up until 19, when Jamaica became independent in 1962, right? Mm -hmm. Then we uh, shared a governor with the Bahamas until the Bahamas became independent. And since then we've had our own, set up our own governor. So we're more direct, the, the relationship has become more direct between us and the United Kingdom ever since then. But um, we still maintain a very strong relationship with Jamaica. Uh, of course, a lot of us, including myself, would have been educated in Jamaican institutions or regional institutions yeah. based in Jamaica. Um, so that relationship is very strong, perhaps stronger than it is in the Eastern Caribbean, again, because of proximity and, and history. I want to expand that then to the TCI's relationship with the rest of the Caribbean. Uh, let's talk about your role in CARICOM. I consider myself personally a Caribbean man because I've had the privilege of living in uh, and visiting and developing relationships with people across the region. And, and so, and I've been around, been involved in public life long enough to appreciate the contributions that have been made uh, by the region. Uh, we've, in the past, we've sourced teachers, doctors, engineers, police officers, uh, and you name it, from different parts of the Caribbean, particularly places like Barbados. Uh, and more recently, a large number of our police officers have been coming from places like St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, I have strong relationships with, with uh, many of the leaders in the region uh, by virtue of the, my the long time I've spent in politics and meeting them one-on-one -on -one and developing relationships. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I've come to value that, the importance of it. And while our growth has been uneven, mm -hmm. I think it's critical that we kind of develop a mentality of one for all and all for one because we live in a region that's very volatile and uh, one could be up today and down tomorrow and so that sort of a dependence and the strength of having each other's back, it, to me, is very critical. And so uh, that is something that I, I believe in. And I think in my role is something that I would like to, to focus on and promote, that regardless to where each of us may be in terms of our growth, economic growth, uh, we should and could contribute to the region and complete and, and especially to the bank's operation and the bank's sustainability and survivability because I noticed in a lot of cases with some of the more prosperous economies uh, they there's this tendency not to appreciate the significant role that the that the bank pay, plays and I, I think that is very short-sighted. I'll just ask you to just respond to the offer from the president of Guyana for instance to deal with food security by offering the, the, the vast land space of, of Guyana for the production of food and distribution across the region? Well, I think that it was very magnanimous uh, of him. I think for a place like the Turks and Caicos, it was a small population and, and significantly removed. The logistical issue of transportation could be a problem in making use of that, even if you have persons here who may want to invest in agriculture or in growing food is still the question of how do you get it here. Um, so, I, But I do believe um, there may be opportunities uh, to trade with a place like Guyana, particularly if, when one look at, I, I don't know what's the state of their forestry products are, but given our construction boom here in these islands, if there are materials or construction materials that could be sourced from a place like that, 
it would be great. I mean, at the moment, we're sourcing it from uh, other places in the Caribbean, uh, including Haiti and the, and the Dominican Republic, and, uh, and Cuba, which are, tend to be a little closer. But um, again, when you look at what Guyana offers, I mean, most of the light poles <laughs> are from Guyana. And when you look at the, the quality of the lumber, would the, I, I think there are opportunities there to cross and vest uh, across this region in each other's economy to the benefit of the region. I think sometimes we, we don't realize the strength that we have. We look out for everything and um, ignore the possibility of developing uh, uh, the relationships that we have like cross investing in each other's economy making it making it easier I mean a great example has been the Sandals Corporation and their ability to tap into the resources and provide employment opportunities for many uh, many destinations within the region including Turks and Caicos in fact uh, in a lot of destinations the airline services have been improved as a result of having a large player such as sandals. And as you, may, as you mentioned, an airline, you certainly have a, a good example in terms of interregional carriage with Inter-Caribbean. Yeah, we're very proud of Inter-Caribbean and its ability to reach out to the rest of the Caribbean uh, sister territories. And I'm hoping that they can continue to, with the expansion and their investment. Uh, for us, it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of pride to be able to to be able to do that. Yeah. Let's turn our attention to, to, the, to, the, to one of the other caps, that is the, the Board of Governors of the Overseas Territories. Um, you've had this now role for some time uh, as part of this rotation. What would you say are the priorities? The Overseas Territories in the Caribbean uh, have done well, by and large. Uh, most of them, certainly the Cayman Islands and Turks and Caicos, uh, have done very well. Some of the other uh, territories in the Eastern Caribbean have not done quite as well. There's a terminology in, that came from a book that was written by another Caribbean personality that says, small is beautiful, I think. Uh, and I think we underestimate the strength and the ability that we can and the role that we can play in the, in the region and in the CDB. Um, and what I would like for my colleagues in the uh, overseas territories to do is to, even though I am the, the rotational governor and the chair, uh, I would certainly want to get their full support uh, because I do believe that we could um, we could uh, make this particular conference something extraordinary uh, and that their presence here could benefit them and, and, and the bank. Uh, I, I can certainly see a situation where um, certainly the Cayman Islands and Turks and Caicos are no longer um, sort of a, um, even though we may be borrowing countries, uh, we are no longer dependent on some of the concessionary uh, funding that the mm -hmm. bank uh, is, uh, may have available, but um, some of our other sister territories are. And to the extent that we could contribute uh, to the, I don't know, to, to some kind of fund uh, to help with uh, pockets of needs in those territories or across the region. Um, I think that the kind of conversation we should start to have instead of constantly looking out for everything, because I think it's important to remember where we were once and relate that to where we are today and, and understand that um, the big wheel comes around and you know, you never know if, if it'll ever happen again. You know? So that's what I um, would encourage them to do and hope, hope that we can play a, a pivotal role in the success and sustainability of the organization. The grouping as such um, has a particular relationship, obviously, with, with, with Britain. Um, 
how do you see the territories now helping to reshape the, the, the impression or, or the relationship with Britain? Well, I tell you one thing, global Britain, in my view, seems very keen on maintaining a relationship with the overseas territories. Um, I think it, it stands to reason that uh, exiting a, a Brexit, it means that the sphere of influence is less. Um, and also what we've seen recently with the royal visits through the region, uh, that, that that they cannot uh, they cannot make the assumption any longer that uh, the former territories, the former colonies, are happy and is prepared to carry on as usual. Um, so I think there seems to be a willingness to focus more attention on the remaining overseas territories. Um, and to the extent that there's this idea of offering the overseas territories a parliamentary representation, direct parliamentary representation in the UK, uh, there are varying degrees of um, uh, views on that. Um, and it's not something I want to necessarily comment on because I think, uh, I, I don't think I'm not, I don't support us being subsumed uh, into the UK or anything like that. But I think the relationship in more recent times, particularly in relationship to the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, have actually served the, the Turks and Caicos and the overseas territories uh, uh, well. Um, so I don't know where that relationship would end, but, but clearly uh, there's a yearning from people everywhere to have control of their destiny. Um, and that's where, where I will leave that. But um, I believe we, we do have a, a role to play in the region, even as we also are influenced and are supported uh, uh, by the United Kingdom. Uh, we have to exert our dependency. I rather like the idea of playing the game without the name, uh, whatever. <laughs> because I think it will serve us well mm -hmm. uh, and I don't believe I believe relationships are more important than labels so that's that's my view and you wouldn't label that independence as I said I think playing the game without the name is what where my head is but you know I'm um, that decision is to be made by the next generation uh, we are in the process of advancing are developing a more advanced constitution or, or trying to because what we've had, a, our constitution has regressed since 2006 as a result of the suspension in 2009. Uh, so we, we're looking at developing a more modern uh, partnership re relationship with the United Kingdom. Um, again, given our size, uh, we have to be concerned uh, and particularly Turks and Caicos given where we are located uh, with huge uh, neighbors that are not necessarily quite as democratic as our tradition, we, we have to be careful about the relationships that we um, maintain. And as you talk about your neighbors, Cuba? Cuba uh, is, uh, we have Cuba, we got Hispanola, both are which are within a hundred miles from our shores. Um, those are, and of course, our neighbor, the Bahamas. Uh, Jamaica is about 400 plus miles away from us. Um, but that's, that's would be our neighborhood there. But, um, and you're comfortable in that neighborhood? The biggest threat to Turks and Caicos uh, sovereignty, if you can call it that, since we're not a nation, is really the threat from illegal immigration from uh, our neighbors next door to the south of us. Uh, and I do believe the region and the world have an, op an obligation uh, to do a better job of assisting our neighbors in Haiti uh, so that 
they are not trafficked because a large part of what happened is literally trafficking. Uh, poor people don't even know where they're going sometimes, you know. Uh, so again, as we dis as I discussed with the president in the past, to the extent that the CDB and the region uh, could develop initiatives to help some of our neighbors who are um, may want to leave, if we can create some conditions at home which would prevent that from happening, fewer people will leave and fewer people will lose their lives on the high, sea, try, high seas trying to escape poverty because it is an economic situation. And, and it's one that I think developed countries ought to be doing more about and are not. Let's, let's return now to the, to the Caribbean Development Bank and its role uh, and you, you as governor. What would be your driving mantra to the bank at this stage? I mentioned early, I believe, I think the bank has an obligation to prove its own continued relevance as well, but it depends on the, the governors, all of the countries, right? Uh, to take a keen interest in the future of the bank. Um, and to, I, I think part of what I would like to see an expansion in the bank's membership, both regionally and globally. And what I'd like us to do again is to see how within, with interregionally, what we can do uh, to, to help each other. Again, using the phrase one for all and all for one, uh, you know, there are some of us, some of our countries who are doing quite well, uh, and there's no reason why we shouldn't be co contributing uh, to, the, to, to lifting some of the, some of our other neighbors, or focusing on projects within particular uh, neighborhoods within uh, our member, member states. So I, I think it's a, it's a fluid discussion that we have to have. I think there need to be some brainstorming around how the bank could continue to be relevant, and how it can be sustainable, what kind of resilient uh, initiatives it needs to take. Uh, no, one, no one person has all of the answers, and that is the reason why it's very, very important for members to show up at the board meeting, and, uh, you know, so we can have these discussions. Because uh, I would not have detailed knowledge of what's happening in many of the sister or, or, the, or, or the member countries, the borrowing member countries, unless that face-to-face -face dialogue is had and we can come up with a, a meeting of the minds uh, it's difficult to, to divine what each person is thinking and, and where, the, where, specifically, where the specific needs are. You talk about resilience, a, a word used a great deal these days, sustainability, etc. How do you see those really impacting the choices we're making for the future of the Caribbean? Well, I, I believe resilience to me is a very broad word speak in terms both of physical and um, systemic. Physical, uh, of course, we live in a, in a part of the world which is very susceptible to, to severe storms, hurricanes, and so I think uh, we certainly need to be building on that kind of resilience, and I believe we do have institutions uh, that, uh, that have uh, sort of answered the call. Uh, Sedema, we've got um, um, the uh, strategic insurance program that helps the region as it relates to hurricanes through this, and this is all through the um, CARICOM. Yeah. Uh, but in relationship to the um, sustainability, generally, I also believe there needs to be uh, more, uh, from a systems point of view, uh, and from a management or e of the economy point of view, uh, I think there's a lot we can learn of, from each other. Uh, we've got smart people within our diaspora. We have smart people within the region. Uh, they, there's, there can be more in terms of knowledge transfer. Uh, there can be 
And some of our people may even have resources that could be invested in, in the region to make the, it more economically sustainable, but also to make the, um, as I say, the management of the, of the region, both at the political level and at the business level, uh, sustainable and, and resilient. Uh, infrastructure, building infrastructure, we should make sure that those are resilient so after, after a storm, you don't, they don't all disappear and now you have to start all over again. Um, you know, in Turks and Caicos, we've been very fortunate with the last hurricane that we've, we've our source of power is very resilient. I mean, we were literally up when countries were down for up to a year, we were literally up and running within six weeks, you know, after a very, very severe storm. So, Building resilience in terms of the physical plant, the, the, uh, the infrastructure, but also our systems of government. Um, we, the ability to expand our infrastructure rests to some extent on how we manage procurement. And I believe across the region I'm hearing complaints about the sort of uh, um, um, anemic rate of drawdown on um, public sector investment uh, programs. And so this is where I think we can help each other. The CDB uh, in particular with its pool of, of knowledge and experience and expertise uh, can, can help, uh, particularly some of the smaller countries who may not be able to uh, purchase data within the confines of the, the boundaries of public service uh, pay scales. And, and so there are all sorts of ways that we can help each other to be more resilient. Finally, Premier, the, the CARICOM experience or experiment, some people talk about it, you, you, you obviously have great faith in it speak to the people? I believe the ability for people to move freely, uh, particularly at a, at the sort of a tertiary education level is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but what I would, would hope we can move the next step to that. And I'm really serious about how we should look at having a sort of a Caribbean exchange where we can cross invest in each other's economy. I mean, we still have this ide ideology that if it comes from the outside, it's better, right? Uh, when in fact, there's so much we can do for ourselves. Uh, and so I, I, think, I think we need to, I don't think we know enough about each other, to be honest with you. And there's always a question of people fear what they don't know, right? And so I think there needs to be a, 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 some kind of serious effort in creating uh, systems that are transferable, in actually creating um, standards that would facilitate uh, the, the movement of people so that if someone from Turks and Caicos saw a, a job opportunity in Barbados, I, they had the same opportunity of, as a Barbadian who live in that country have for that, that job, particularly if it's a regionally created uh, job. That, so that, that kind of movement and the ability to, to learn more, I mean, you know, in the old days when most of us in the region went to UWI or Michael Training College, I think we knew a lot more about each other. These days, so many of our kids now are not going to regional institutions. They're going to schools in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Canada, and places. So I think uh, most of the leaders in, in my age group are people 
would have known each other because they would have met at university in Jamaica, on Cayfield, Barbados, uh, I mean, in, in uh, Trinidad. Uh, but that doesn't happen anymore. So to a large extent, we don't know as much as we used to know. And I think somehow we need to find a way to reacquaint ourselves, because I think that's going to be important for, for the future development of the region. Thank you, sir. The Premier of the Turks and Caicos Islands, Washington Mizek, joining us here ahead of the Caribbean Development Bank's Board of Governors meeting coming in June. I'm Julian Rogers.